Today on the show, I'm happy to have Marty Ringline. He's a general partner at the Adventure Fund. They're investing in early stage founders and late stage disruptors such as SpaceX, Chime, Plaid, Coinbase, Roblox, Beehive, Uber, Liveblox, Deal, and Stripe. So Marty, how much have you invested to date with this fund? Yeah, so this is a $10 million fund. Uh, I've been angel investing over 12 years now, but this fund is $10 million. When did you found this fund? This one, the Adventure Fund's 2019, and then we've got two funds in that, and then we have a fund that predates that before, before 2019. How many LPs do you have in uh, this particular fund? Yeah, so we like having a lot of LPs. We like it being more of a community. So we've got about 150 LPs. Most of them are seasoned operators, so folks that were early engineers at places like LinkedIn or Shopify, and then they just got on to, to do well in their careers, accumulate a, a high net worth, and now they mostly angel invest themselves. So what was it that brought you into the space of venture investing? Oh uh, yeah, I started, I, if you go way back, I'm just a designer who was so in the early 2000s, that's a pretty rare skill set, but it got me into entrepreneurship where I created a company that I didn't know was going to be a startup, I to do a startup, that startup called Opposition, we sold it to Twitter back in 2012. And then that just honestly afforded me a little bit of disposable income, transporting me into the heart of San Francisco at a pretty you know, interesting time. Because um, other than 2012, I'd say like 2008, and then like right now, probably the most exciting in sort of my angel investor in recent history, and just started making angel investments. And then you fast forward 10 years, so that's 2012, some of those investments went pretty well and gave me a little bit of a track record, at least enough to create a tiny little fund in the world adventure capital is million, pretty small. With that acquisition of Twitter taking it over, what was that experience? Was, were you expecting that or did it catch you off guard? Yeah, if I rewind like maybe four months before Twitter, it definitely caught us off guard. We, uh, we were an R&D shop just doing experimental, good experimentation, mostly for Silicon Valley. Companies. So Apple was our biggest customer. And eventually Apple makes an acquisition offer, but it's very unromantic. Yeah, it's basically, oh, we see how much we're paying you every year. We're assuming we're probably somewhere with team. Twitter reached out and that was just like, you're big Twitter fans, all the early users, early adapters, but I had no idea that they were looking to do an acquisition. So I think we were their sixth acquisition all in, and this is about a year and a half before the IPO. So rel relatively early in Twitter's life cycle. Through working with Apple, what did you actually encounter with the Apple Watch? Yeah. So Apple was a really fun uh, project because they... So if, if you got to go back in time for some of this stuff. And I know some folks listening will be like, it'll predate them. But when the iPhone comes out, it's, it takes a pretty strong stance that nobody really cares about until the iPad comes out. And that's that there's no flash is not going to be on this thing. A lot of people are like, what the heck's flash? Flash is how we used to stream video. It's how we used to do anything really interactive on the web. Um, it doesn't exist today, and most people have never heard of it today, specifically because Steve Jobs said no flash in um, the iPad. And then there were people were like, how are you going to serve really high-end interactive apps? Because all the cool advertising that you did was in flash. And if you can't do advertising, then who's going to use this device? Why would any publisher or any magazine want this device when all their um, advertisers are, are using flash? And so his answer was this on a nascent technology called HTML5. And he said, hey, this is the future. We were big believers in that prior to him saying the comments. There's only, I'd say, probably 10,000 people on the entire planet who are dabbling in HTML5 at this point, which is going to be, you know, in that 10,000 cohort. And so we're doing all this experimentation to see, like, how can you make HTML5, CSS3 match or improve what Flash did in the iPad, the iPhone? And they would constantly send us specs for things that didn't exist yet. And you always knew what it was. It's the next iPhone, right? Bigger screen, better processor, more memory. Okay. Super secret, but I get it. Next iPhone is going to be this. We can't tell anybody, but that's cool. Uh, but one time, like about three and a half years into working with them, we get a spec and we think, okay, Apple just really loves us. They love working with us so much that they're messing with us because they sent us, uh, and you kind of foreshadowed it, but they sent us this spec where the processor was really slow, the, almost archaically slow. The JavaScript engine just felt like we were designing something for early 90s, late 90s. Like, why would they do this? We have, this clearly isn't the next version of the iPhone or the iPad. What could this possibly be? We thought, okay, they're just having fun with us. Um, but we couldn't make it work. because we, we couldn't create an interactive experience that was better. In this case, so in the, in the very first iteration of this, it was better. Now that enough years have 
it's, it's better than objective C. So can you have a web-based experience that's better than a native experience? Most people don't realize today that most of our native apps are actually web-based behind the scenes. They're not powered by objective C anymore. Some of them are using Swift. But um, with this particular one, we couldn't do it. Objective C was better uh, all the way around. We couldn't make a better web-based view. And then about a year and a half later, we realized when they make the announcement, oh, this device was the watch. That this tiny little screen with this archaic processor, this, this old JavaScript engine running it. Uh, and to this day, if anybody who has the watch, there's no Safari browser on that watch. And if you ever wonder why, it dates back to this early experimentation and we couldn't make it work. And what I find fascinating is from that time, call it 2011 to today, they still haven't made it work. There's still no Safari browser. And I'm a little fearful that they got this memo from us years ago that, hey, it can't be done. And nobody's thought to check, hey, it's been like 12 years. Maybe we should put a Safari browser in the lot. But the, yeah, the end of that was just the better experience win. But at the time, you couldn't have a really great web-based experience on something as small as a watch. Yeah, they may have realized, hey, nobody's really complaining about not having the internet in there. Right. <laughs> when, I, when I tell versions of this story, most people are like, Oh yeah, there is no Safari browser on my watch. No one's ever been like, yeah, I'm so frustrated that I can't open a web browser on my watch. And no one's even realized that they've had this thing on their wrist for 12 years. Yeah, what, what the experience to be involved at such an early stage with that. So after you did this and sold that business to Twitter, you had another exit, right? Yeah, I left Twitter pretty short, but I got this amazing opportunity to go to the White House and be an innovation fellow under um, Obama's last administration. And then that was a term position though. So I knew it was going to end. And so I was thinking, okay, what the heck am I going to do next? I just left Twitter. And so what's, what's cooler than that? And because uh, also got to remember 2013, Twitter's still pretty cool. Probably like one of the best startups at the time. Um, now maybe it's debatable. I still love it. But started bringing my old team back together and saying, hey, got another idea. Let's go build something and let's see what the world thinks about it. And then that thing eventually gets bought and acquired by Eventbrite. And so we go and join the Eventbrite team. And that was late 2016. So you have a history here of selling to very well-known companies, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. and I, I, what I like is uh, the timing. The Eventbrite same as Twitter. Pivotable moment for them. They were about uh, 18 months from IPO as well. So, you know, that was fun time to watch your company, like break its thousandth employee, you're ready to IPO and you see what the world looks like and watch it transform after that. With the second exit, was that more planned since you now are like, oh, I can build businesses that are available? Yeah, a lot of people ask me this and I, I think the hardest people that ask me this are venture capitalists. If we ever go raise for another company as it's Marty, why would I invest in you if your whole shtick is just to flip these things, sell them quickly, um, which on one level, great reputation to have, right? Okay, you can build something massive and then go sell it to somebody who's more massive. Um, as, my, as an investor myself, I wouldn't want to invest in that person. And so no, the, the, the goal isn't to go in to sell it, but we, I always want to hedge our risks. And so the most startups fail. And why would I presume that I'm any different, right? I'm not... You can't presume that I'm a better founder than the other founders, maybe a little bit more experienced, but my likelihood of failing is still pretty high. And so when we go and do a fundraise, at the same time, I want to see, you know, what acquisitions look like, who's out there, who's buying, uh, what the competitive landscape is, because it's twofold. Yeah, I get into a meeting with Eventbrite early. Maybe there's something there, maybe there's not, but they learn about our roadmap, but just at the same time that I learned about theirs. And so Eventbrite actually brought us in before we even closed the pre-seed round of that company. So they flew us out to California. We got to meet with Kevin Hartz, which like, to me, like, this is amazing that this billionaire is going to take this time to meet with me. And then he says something, though, that I think is super critical for us. We're sitting there and he just, he doesn't even realize what he says. He's just, we're, we're talking for an hour and a half, but he just goes, yeah, you know what kills most of these startups like yours? Fraud. And then and he moves on to the next topic. But I just remember thinking, okay, let me write that down. I'm like, okay, as soon as we leave, why does fraud kill, you know, a bed tech startup? And like, oh, okay, I'm in the marketplace business. I'm collecting credit cards. Now I get that people would steal my list of stolen credit cards. They'd run through my platform. I'd pay them out. I'd never be able to re recoup that money. So, oh, okay. This is a pretty big deal. Like on the roadmap now, fraud, right? And then, but this is important for us because one, fraud never is a problem for us. We create really interesting algorithms around fraud early before there's really a strike to do it for us. And it really puts us in a position where now we understand fintech. We didn't really know that we were going to be a fintech game. We just thought we were going to make really cool RSVP experiences. 
uh, and that becomes critical later in our careers too. So with the, the knowledge that most startups fail, why the decision to now invest in early stage startups and founders? Yeah. So if, you, you know, if you're not in the investment game, uh, you will be familiar with this term, the power law, but we live and die by the power law and the power law is the answer to your question. Just to make the math easy, let's just say I'm going to do 12 investments a year, right? One a month. Of those 12 though, the math is that 11 of them will fail. They'll go to zero. But the one that doesn't, right? It needs to be so successful and so big that it pays for the other 11. So you need a really big outsized return on that one. But it means of 11 out of 12, that's 98% like, like, or 92%. So I'm going to be 92% wrong with my decisions, right? But I'll be 8% right. But the 8%, like it needs to be the one that's truly disruptive and transformative. And I think for us, it's fun going out and hunting for that, that 8%. I'm looking for the 8%. And what I think as a founder, oh, I want to be in the 8%. What does it take, what does it take to be there? Yeah, with, with that knowledge of the power law, right? 92% of... I'm, and you're vetting them, right? You're doing all this due diligence, but you still know the chances of success. There's so many outliers. Is there still a very strict process you go through of deciding, okay, I know I'm going to be wrong 11 out of 12 times, but this is the process I use to get that one. The process we use to get that one. So it depends, right? Because there's a sliding scale. And I think founders wish there was just a one singular answer so that they could just meet the criteria and be successful. But you know, I, I think a lot of people would say something cliche. Oh, it's the team or the channel. I think that's true. But that doesn't mean that you need a founding team who like sold their last company to Google for $100 million. Uh, it could mean that you're two undergrads right out of Berkeley who are starting their, their next thing. You have zero experience. They could still win. So it's not always the team. I think there's team dynamics in there. There's team relationships that are important. But a little bit's the idea. And then I think for us, we like to, because we like early stage exclusively, we want you to be thinking differently than everybody else. I want to hear a pitch unlike what I've ever heard before. And so as a founder myself, when I go and pitch, I want to make sure that I'm pitching a narrative and that I hope the investors in the room are saying, huh, I don't know if he's going to make it. I don't know if this startup's going to win, but I do know we've never heard this pitch before. And I, what I love is when they say, oh, and this pitch seems like obvious, it should exist. But how in our 30 years of venture capital has no one come into the room with this one before? Well, this is where I feel bad for a lot of early stage founders because they get so frustrated when you know, see meetings don't go well or investor meetings don't go well, but I don't think they realized that the pitch they just put in front of us, which they're really passionate about, they put a lot of energy and excitement into, they, I've heard six or seven of the exact same narrative that week. And then of the entire quarter, there's probably a hundred of them telling the exact same. We're seeing it now with AI. Everybody wants like a local LLM that's more secure, that takes all of your financial data across all silos and it gives you all of these really interesting reports. Like, like this is every pitch I hear. And then every time I hear it, you can hear the energy in the room is as though first time I'm hearing. And they don't know that it's every founder's coming in with the same idea. It makes sense, right? If they're targeting this little sector that nobody else is thinking about, they're being very creative. Maybe this is the one we should invest in. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, we're looking for high levels of creativity, ingenuity. And they, well, what is that clear path to get there? And I mean, that's what throws a lot of first time founders off. We're constantly asking them, hey, once you're done with this race, no one's ever thinking about the next race, even though you should be, is if you are a high growth company and you are going to be venture scalable, you're going to have to race again. So what metrics do you need to hit for the next race? And that's all I'm measuring you against. Because now it's even if I did the deal sometime between the next 18 to 24 months for you to hit those metrics, that's all I care about the investor up. Are, are you getting closer to that number? Because if not, you're not going to race that next round because we've all agreed. And if you don't, like, you're dead. And if you're dead, I've lost my investment. So Marty, if any of our founders or potential investors wanted to get in touch, how could they do so? Yeah, you all, my, my, my personal email is super easy. It's marty at marty.com. So M-A-R-T-Y at marty.com. Perfect. Well, thank Twitter. you, Marty. Actually, I, I shouldn't even do that. Follow me on Twitter. So above my Twitter follower is up. I just hit 10K last year. So now it's on to 20K. So it's, it's at Marty Madrid. Very good, Marty. Thank you for coming on the show and everybody for listening to another episode of Failing to Success. If you like the show, make sure to subscribe. I'm your host, Chad Kalecki, and we'll see you next time.